another night has arrived, and the auroras are in the sky, glowing just as bright as you and I. Hi there, it's Jordan, Jordan Bianchi, your host of Aurora Airwaves. Welcome back. This past Monday, in western New York and in much of the United States, we experienced a complete solar eclipse. Watching the land become shrouded in darkness was an uncanny experience. I spent it with my family, and I'm really grateful that I could. When the sun returned, there was this profound feeling that we had entered a new chapter in our lives. Perhaps that aligns with where my heart and mind have been lately, of sensing a new chapter on the horizon in my own life, as I make peace with the past and let hardships and limiting beliefs go. If the moon can block out the light of the sun and cause everyone in its path to look up in a wonder, everything is possible. Anything can be accomplished. But one area of letting go is seeing what is now on the other side of the eclipse. I look at my periods of self-discovery years ago with such fondness, especially now. Growth is awkward. Growth is hard. And it's not the sort of thing that we want to have to do. But we need to if we want to move our lives forward. My thoughts take me back to a few years ago, during a particularly difficult period of growth. When I wrote the first thing as an adult that opened my eyes and let my heart pour out into the world with vulnerability and love. I'd kept these to myself, these feelings, these thoughts, and these emotions. But finally I knew I had to practice, I had to share. It wasn't a film that I wrote, and it wasn't a book or a short story. It wasn't anything that I could have predicted. It was a Facebook post that announced that my dog, Beethoven, a small little black and gray cockapoo, had passed away. Beethoven had a long and healthy life and experienced very little pain as we showered him with love as he went on to his next stage of his celestial journey. I'd like to share a moment from what I wrote. In the past few weeks, bay has been steadily slowing down. Often he'd choose to sleep on floors and in the upstairs hallway instead of my parents' bed, as he did last night. But at around 4 a.m., after he gulped down a much-needed glass of water that was given to him by mom, he came into my room and asked for me to put him on my bed. Maybe he didn't want to be alone. Maybe he didn't want me to be. I picked him up and set him on the sheets. He crawled next to me, and for a few hours, we finally got some sleep. I ended my post by saying, We Bianchis are spent. And although our hearts ache, they've been beaming with love and gratitude for being able to spend close to 12 years with such a sweet and kind dog. We loved feeding him romaine lettuce and broccoli, sneaking him sweet and sour chicken when we'd order Chinese food, letting him explore the backyard and chase deer, taking him on countless walks and giving him thousands of treats. We loved how he snuggled with us when we watched movies, how he'd parade around the house after a haircut or a bath, needing to show us his new look, and how warm and welcoming he was to our friends and family. He calmed us, opened our hearts, and was a testament to how glorious this life can be. I couldn't have asked for a better companion to grow up with. I realized it at the time, but that's not how it began. When I was young, just starting high school, I dreamt about having a dog for years and years, a wild-like animal that I could wrestle with and run around and chase. Beethoven was the polar opposite of what I had been expecting. The jet black little animal was keen on sitting still by himself. He did not want to fetch. He did not want to play. He did not want to be hugged and picked up. He didn't even want to be near me. I wanted to return him, but my parents knew better. I was rambunctious, wild myself with energy that couldn't be matched. We were opposites and we were now living in the same house. It took years for me to understand our relationship. He wouldn't step foot in my room, he wouldn't listen to me, and he wouldn't come near. 
By the time I was in college, there was another dog that had become a regular topic of conversation at family gatherings. Chaser, the Border Collie. Maybe you've heard of her. My Aunt Pilly's father, Dr. John Pilly, had published a scientific journal that proved the Chaser knew the names of over a thousand words, as well as forms of grammar, findings that had not been properly documented in the scientific community yet. The world was shocked by this knowledge and erupted in applause. Seriously. Not everyone has Neil deGrasse Tyson film an episode of Nova at their house, have Anderson Cooper fly to the college where they teach to film a segment regarding their research, or be invited to the highest tier of news stations in New York City. It was a big deal. Dr. Pilly's findings were fascinating. I had the opportunity to edit videos for him of footage that was shot in Spartanburg, South Carolina, the place where he, his wife Sally, and Chaser called home. We had Chaser for several weeks before we even gave her her name. In our family, we've always sought to give our dogs names that seem to fit their spirit. We named her because one day, a red Jeep came by and she flew after the Jeep. So her name we chose as Chaser. The daily routine is primarily, you can guess, P-L-A-Y, play. Play is the major, major reinforcer for Chaser's learning. Too often, dog owners use food only as a reinforcer for behaviors. We have found that play is infinitely greater than food. It's not as distracting, and dogs don't satiate on play. This book is different because it actually confirms what dog lovers have always known. Your dog is smarter than you think. I listened to dozens and dozens of hours of him being interviewed, where I was able to absorb his philosophies on life as much as his views on science. They were woven together. Data paved the way for a higher quality of life for humans and dogs, which was a magical spiritual experience for him and for myself. The bond he and Chaser had was just that. There was an unsaid connection between the two, the way they responded to each other the few words he needed to say to communicate to her, and how she communicated to him. He knew what to look for because of the stillness he had in his life. John was a man of the natural world, a paddler, an athlete, an adventurer. He found deep connection to nature. And he knew that dogs were one of our most direct ways to access that special energy. That's when I started to listen to Beethoven sitting with Beethoven and not petting him all the time, letting him come to me if he wanted to, speaking in a softer voice, finding out what he liked and not urging him to play in ways that I had always wanted him to when I was younger. And just like that, we began to bond. Dr. Pilly's research and anecdotes illuminated the fact that you need to let your dog be a dog. Let them be their own individual. The tone in your voice, what you reinforce and do not reinforce, shapes their ability to be curious, listen to their gut, and be themselves. This is why he chose his words precisely as to not confuse his dogs, the dogs that came before Chaser and Chaser. He led them in ways that corresponded with their personalities, and he spoke softly to them. During his last year, while he underwent chemo, Beethoven and I were tied at the hip. He came when I called his name. There was more trust than there had ever been. Trips to the vet meant trips to Tim Hortons for a Timbit, a donut hole. He slept in my bed and followed me around, not for the treats, not to get anything out of me, but because we were finally connected. I found solace that we were able to keep a careful eye on him and step in before any pain was experienced. But when he passed, I was filled with grief and I was stuck. I was so depressed. And when I was looking for answers, I went to books. And then I thought of the book about Chaser, 
that Dr. John Pilly had written about his experience with his dog and the dogs that had come before. I hadn't touched it in years. There was a passage early on that popped into my head and I wanted to read it again, which I'm going to read to you right now. This is from Chaser, Unlocking the Genius of the Dog Who Knows a Thousand Words, by John W. Pilly with Hilary Heinzman. This section is before Chaser was born, when Yasha, Dr. Pilly's dog, died. A friend of mine says, if you get a pet, eventually you'll get a broken heart. The relatively short lifespans of our pets cause us a lot of grief, but they can also ground us in the natural cycle of life and death. And if we can accept it, renewal, the spirit of our relationship with one pet lives on and and shapes the spirit of our relationship with another pet, even years later. I thought I knew that after our family's experiences with our first dog, Fluffy, a collie Sally rescued when she was pregnant with Robin, and then with Bimbo and Grindle, but I still had a lot to learn about loss and renewal. Border collies often work with sheep until they are 14 or even 15 years old. Yasha was so vigorous for so long that I found it hard to accept when he began to slow down dramatically. Through the fall semester of 1993, he faithfully and efficiently served as a teaching assistant and research subject. But at the beginning of the spring semester, I saw that Yasha no longer had the energy to go to Wofford and be by my side day in and day out. I began leaving him at home, and our reunions every day were bittersweet. One cold day in March, I sensed something was wrong as soon as I came to the door. Yasha, I called, and then raising my voice, because at 16 years of age, Yasha was a little deaf. Yasha, I'm home. The whimpers that came back cut through me. I followed the sounds and found Yasha lying on a rug in our first floor bedroom. I've left you alone too long, haven't I, boy? I said as I knelt down beside him and stroked his head. Sally was in New York City visiting Debbie, my daughter and no one else was in the house. Yasha relaxed under my touch, looking into his trusting brown eyes and seeing his indomitable spirit flashing there. I asked myself if it was time to let him go. I couldn't let myself think that it was. Come on, Yasha. Let's get you some water and some food, if you want it. I got to my feet and half turned to the door. Yasha strained to get to his feet, but he couldn't. When I'd left the house a few hours earlier, he'd still been able to get up and walk around. When I bent down to pick Yasha up, feeling how thin he was gave me another wrench. I carried him into the kitchen, then knelt down with him cradled in my arms so he could drink a few sips of water. I carried him to the living room couch and sat beside him, scratching his ears. He lifted his head and looked at me with utter trust then lowered his head to his paws and fell into a slight doze. He lifted his head and looked at me with utter trust, then lowered his head to his paws and fell into a light doze. While he slept, I convinced myself it was not time to let him go. When he stirred awake intermittently, I saw him become aware of his discomfort, and my heart sank. Around 10 o'clock, Yasha woke up and started panting. He was suffering, and I knew I couldn't let that continue any longer. I called the emergency animal clinic to make sure the vet was on duty. Then I wrapped Yasha in a blue blanket against the cold and carried him onto my pickup truck. It was only a 10-minute drive, and every second of the way I wished it was longer. The vet examined Yasha and agreed with me that it was time to help him on his way. He gave Yasha a sedative and then an injection to stop his heart. It was almost more than I could stand to see the light go out of Yasha's eyes. Back home, I carried Yasha, still wrapped in a blue blanket from shoulder to tail, into the bedroom, and put him on top of the bed. 
fully clothed, with my shoes still on, I lay down beside him and turned out the light. The next morning, I went slowly about the house in a daze, picking up and putting down Yasha's toys, various frisbees, all of them chewed around the edges, especially his favorite yellow one and a stuffed rabbit with one eye and torn ears that Sally had mended over and over. I was in no hurry for what was to come next, but it had to be done. I got a shovel and went out behind the house to where Grindel was buried. It was a grassy spot shaded by three oaks and a pine. Turning back to face the house, which I'd built myself in a log cabin style, I remembered how Yasha had followed me up on the ladder one day when I was finishing the roof, and I'd had to carry him back to Houn. I started to dig. The effort released the tears I'd been holding back for hours, and I had to stop several times to lean on the shovel to prop myself up. Finally, the two-by-three-foot grave was ready. I went inside and got Yasha, still wrapped in the blue blanket, and gently laid him beside the grave. I went back inside for his favorite yellow frisbee, the stuffed bunny, and the brown-yellow collar, which he hadn't been wearing because he was so thin. I sat down beside Yasha and his things, covered my face with my hands, and wept. When my tears finally stopped and I looked up, the sky was lowering and threatening to pour with rain. I couldn't wait any longer. I picked up Yasha and embraced him one last time, then laid him in the grave with his yellow frisbee, stuffed bunny, and collar. Slowly, I picked up the shovel and began to fill the grave with dirt. I knew my friends would tell me to get another dog, another border collie soon, and I knew I couldn't do that. I told myself I would never get another dog, and I allowed myself once more to cry. Walking slowly toward the house, I recalled my grandmother's words whenever we came home from a funeral service for someone near and dear to her. As the front door slammed behind me, I heard her holler, Child, it's not the letting go that hurts so much, it's the holding on. But I wasn't ready to let go. So I decided to gingerly lock this pain into a black box inside me, where it would be safe until I could fully resolve it. I went inside to call Sally and tell her what had happened. I too held on to my grief for quite a while. With Beethoven gone, the house was quieter. There were no vet appointments to go to anymore. There was no more bowl to fill with food, no water to pour, no walks. But the idea of renewal spoke to me, and learning that Dr. Pilly, a luminary to many, grieved deeply as well, helped me validate the time that it was taking me to heal, the cycle of healing. If years later he was able to find such success, such a deep relationship with Chaser, maybe there would be a bright tomorrow. Maybe the light could be let back in. We as humans get to shape so much of our dog's experience. And with the right attitude, it can become one of life's most cathartic and compassionate experiences. The loss of a pet is difficult because of the illusion that they are no longer with us. Our hearts can close off, afraid to mourn more in the future. It's important to remember that life opens our hearts. By experiencing the world time and time again, we enrich our lives. When the cycle of renewal came years later, Chaser, who was just a puppy, entered their family and brought so much joy into John and Sally's lives. In time, Aunt Pilly sent her parents and Chaser off to their next celestial adventures. What they learned affected her. She saw how she had grown with their story, how their legacy was something she could continue, something she had to continue. Over the next few years, she wrote and wrote and wrote. The Chaser Initiative came to life, a nonprofit dedicated to educating children on how to interact with dogs and treat them well, 
as well as supporting research opportunities to enhance canine lives. This last year, Aunt Pilly released her first book, For the Love of Dog, a written and visual guide to help teach people about the deep bond and history of humans and dogs, as well as educate readers on the behaviors of dogs and how we can best interact with them. Why am I sharing all of this? Because I've learned that being vulnerable when pouring out life experiences into the things that we create makes all the difference. Of course, you can hear this now in the way these episodes are crafted. But back then, writing my little post about Beethoven was the first glimpse of me being emotional and sharing it to people. Back then, I was trying so hard to write larger works, but it goes to show that sometimes the beginning of a journey, or even throughout a bigger journey... One of the best things to do as a writer is to come back to center and communicate a small moment deep from within us. I believe that act gets us in the moment and allows us to see who we really are and how we need to grow. I believe that that act gets us in the moment and allows us to see who we really are. Moments like this in secession helped my writing become more me and allowed my emotions to transform more rapidly into favorable ones of understanding. A fun writing exercise I was fortunate to be able to have was to join in on the Chaser adventure. Aunt Pilly asked me to write Chaser's story in the format that would be best for young readers, as I was beginning to see that writing for elementary and middle grade readers was a passion of mine. Through our collaboration, we wrote Chasing Joy, which I'm going to read to you all right now. Chaser took the world by storm when it was proven that she understood the names of 1,022 toys, as well as adverbs, verbs, preposition objects, and sentences involving multiple elements of grammar, all through the love of play. On a sheep ranch in the rolling green hills of South Carolina, there lived a newborn puppy. She had bright brown eyes and a beautiful speckled coat with a black patch over her left eye. She loved to explore the ranch. Every day, she watched her parents herd flocks of sheep. Farmer Wayne, the owner of the ranch, told her, when you're all grown up, you'll have a flock of your own. One day, an older couple came to the farm, a man named Dr. Pilly and his wife, Sally. They loved her bright eyes and her warm smile. As she crawled into Sally's lap, she knew she had chosen them as her new family. They took her home to their log cabin and sat with her on the porch, wondering what they should name her. The puppy watched the cars fly by. She wanted to be that fast, so she took off to chase one. Dr. Pilly and Sally cried out for her to stop. If she went out into the road, she could get hurt. But Puppy had not yet been taught what their human words meant, so she kept running. It felt good to run. Once they caught up with her, they knew they had to teach her not to chase cars. When Rob and their eldest daughter stopped by with her dogs to meet the puppy, Dr. Pilly and Sally told her how scared they had been. Look at the bright side. Now you know what to call her, said Robin. Chase her. The Pillies agreed. It fit her personality, and they'd never forget the day she chased after the car. Welcome to the family, Chaser, said Dr. Pilly. Dr. Pilly was a professor at nearby Wofford College. He studied what animals could learn. He and his students worked with dogs who had learned to open doorknobs, climb ladders, and even answer phones. Chaser loved to learn from Dr. Pilly. He taught her to sit, and to stay, and to roll over. And then he taught her to never run after cars. Dr. Pilly saw that she learned best when she was playing and having fun. Sometimes Chaser made mistakes, but when she did, he never raised his voice. He didn't want her to feel bad. Learning new things can be hard, and if she no longer had fun, she would not chase after new things that she was curious about. So when she needed encouragement to try again, he made sure she knew he believed in her by whispering, Do it, girl. 
You can do it. When she got things right, he petted her and said, good girl, Chaser. Chaser learned quickly. Dr. Pilly grew curious. How much could Chaser learn? Dr. Pilly and Sally brought home new toys. There was an octopus, a crayfish, a seal. He gave them new names and taught them to her. Inky, Crawdad, Seal. She remembered them all. Chaser learned the names of many more toys. She thought of the toys as her own flock. Soon she had a pile that was bigger than her bed. It grew bigger than the couch, bigger than the kitchen table, and finally so big that it needed its own room. By her third birthday, Chaser knew the names of over 1,000 words. Dr. Pilly also taught her other parts of language, verbs, adverbs, different categories, and the way sentences were formed, just like human children. She had learned more than any dog before her. Dr. Pilly called his friend Dr. Reed to tell him how much Chaser had learned. My word, said Dr. Reed, how did you do it? If you give your dog your heart, she'll give you hers, said Dr. Pilly. Together, you can achieve anything. If people only knew how smart their dogs really are, Dr. Reed said, so much good could come of it. Dr. Pilly agreed. People needed to know Chaser's story. He decided to write a paper that could prove to scientists how special what she had learned was. He wrote in the mornings at his paper coffee shop. He wrote in the afternoons on the porch. He wrote at school. And he wrote before bedtime. It was difficult, but Sally Robin and Dr. Reed encouraged Dr. Pilly to keep going. You're about to change the world, Sally said. When Dr. Pilly finished the paper and sent it off, he returned to his favorite thing playing with Chaser. Months passed. It was nearly Christmas. The house smelled of pine and glistened with gold. Dr. Pilly and Chaser were sitting by the fire when the phone rang. It was Dr. Pilly's younger daughter, Deb. Dad, said Deb, Chaser's gone viral. Dr. Pilly looked at Chaser, confused. She looks healthy to me. Deb laughed. No, Dad. It's your paper. People all over the world know about Chaser. Deb told Dr. Pilly that a producer in New York City wanted Chaser to come and show what she had learned on television. Well, should we go to the Big Apple? Sally asked. Chaser barked with excitement. Chaser's right, said Dr. Pilly. It's time for an adventure. They packed for their cross-country voyage, and Robin sent them off with big hugs. They drove to New York, where they stayed with Deb and her husband Jay, and their son Aiden. The city was very different from home. On her walks, Chaser smelled pretzels and hot dogs, falafels and flowers. She played in parks and met people from all over the world. That night, they rode the ferry. From afar, they saw the glow of the big city. We'll be in one of those skyscrapers tomorrow, said Dr. Pilly. How about that? And I promise you, no matter what happens tomorrow, you won't have to do anything if you're not having fun. At sunrise, they drove across the bridge to the studio. As they got closer, the buildings got taller. The streets got busier. Chaser remembered what Dr. Pilly had told her. Today was all about having fun. The studio was filled with cameras and big, bright lights. The producer led Chaser to set. It looked perfect for play with lots of familiar objects and some new ones. But they raised a curtain that blocked her view of her family. Chaser grew nervous. Dr. Pilly knew Chaser well. He talked to the producer. We want her to perform by herself, said the producer, to make sure her language skills are real. Chaser's language skills can't be performed alone, Dr. Pilly explained. She's happiest when she's with the people she loves and she can only show what she's learned when she's happy. The producer understood. He lowered the curtain. Chaser was no longer nervous, but Dr. Pilly was. Sally took his hand. You've taught her well. She can do it. Three, two, one, live. Chaser worked her magic for the cameras. One after another, she picked up the correct toys. She even learned the name of a new toy on the spot. That day, 
millions of people saw what Chaser could do. When they finished filming, the audience applauded. Chaser ran to her family. You did it, girl, said Dr. Pilly. I'm happy you had fun. When they left the studio, New Yorkers waved and cheered. New York's newest star, the smartest dog in the world. We love you, Chaser. On the drive home to South Carolina, Chaser dreamed. She dreamed of everything that she had seen and all the new things she could learn. There were so many more adventures ahead. With her family by her side, she could chase them all. Last year, Pilly Bianchi and Callum Heath released For the Love of Dog, the ultimate relationship guide. Observations, lessons, and wisdom to better understand our canine companions. This is just a wonderful, beautiful book that is easily digestible and incredibly informative. Here's one section that I want to read. And I highly recommend you check this book out. Chaser's learning was boundless. The more she learned, the more she was able to learn. The same is true for you and your dog. What you will discover in your journey with your pup is that mistakes will happen, and that's okay. They are valuable in pointing us in the proper direction, and you'll never find a more forgiving partner than a dog. What you will discover in your journey with your pup is that mistakes will happen, and that's okay. They are valuable in pointing us in the proper direction, and you'll never find a more forgiving partner than your dog. Chaser set the stage for a new way to think about the mind of the dog, what the dog can understand, what they are capable of, and how to incorporate their own minds into our relationships with them. John Pilly believed that there will be a world of many chasers. She may go down in history as the dog with the largest vocabulary, but she will not go down in history as the only dog capable of this type of achievement. Others working with our method are popping up around the globe. Many members of Canis Familiaris can display chasers' abilities. Even the dog living in your own home. The next quote that I just want to say is what John always said to Chaser. Do it, girl. You can do it. My biggest takeaway from the journey of Chaser that has been present in my life for so long is that we make mistakes and we don't need to be hard on ourselves about those mistakes. As Pili Bianchi's noted, mistakes lead us in the direction of healing, of awareness, and growth. John's journey through discovery, academia, spirituality, and grief all led him in the direction of growth. And his journey of growth didn't stop when he was 30, or 40, or 50. As an octogenarian, he was still pursuing knowledge companionship and connection. These lessons helped me move forward in my own life, deepen my relationship with my dog, and was the template for how I could treat people better in my own life, as well as myself. The way that I began to speak to my own dog by listening and being gentle became the reference point for how I could speak to myself. I highly recommend you look into the chaser story. Whether it's chaser unlocking the genius of the dog, who knows a thousand words, or for the love of dog. There's a lot of valuable knowledge here. Next week on Aurora Airwaves, I sit down with my Aunt Pilly for a long conversation about artistry, creation, and what it was like working with the chaser team. Come and sit down with us, learn all about her father and the way that he conducted his research, but also come and learn about her career as a musician. We also discuss music and what that means in the creative realm. Pilly is a pianist, a singer-songwriter, producer, and owner of Bianchi Musica, which plays at fabulous events all throughout the country and world. 
we discuss songwriting, creativity, creative limitations, and how we can free ourselves to chase our bliss, chase our joy, just like John and Chaser did. So tune in next week for a fantastic conversation with Pilly. But for now, I want to play a song that she wrote back in the day called Blood is Thicker Than Water. She says to ring in my ears, but I guess I shut my mind.
If you liked this episode of Aurora Airwaves, please give us a five-star review on Spotify. It helps us grow. It really, really does. Please join us on YouTube, where the podcast also lives in its multimedia format. And join us on Instagram and Facebook to continue the conversation in between the episodes. I look forward to sharing more with you next week. Take care.